Welcome to St. Stephen's Lansdowne. My name's Andrew Avramenko. I'm the curate here and one of the priests for St. Stephen's and for St. Mary's Chalcombe, our sister church. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you today for this informal service of worship. In this service, we'll have two readings from the Bible that will be heard in St. Stephen's and St. Mary's this week. You'll find links to those readings and to other things in the description that accompany this service on YouTube. As well as the readings, we'll also share in the sermon that I've been guided to, and we'll have a time of prayer too. And as it's informal, you might like to join me in sipping from a cup of tea as we spend the next half an hour together. Cheers. Well, for quite a few months now, we've been exploring the foundations of our faith with the opening books of the Bible. In the book of Genesis, we saw the challenges and blessings coming from God's promise made to Abraham and the dysfunctional dynasty that God preserved, persevered with, to tell the world not only of his existence, but also of his forgiving love. Recently, we found our way into the book of Exodus, where we've seen how God was with the family of faith that became Israel, as they lived under a dark and oppressive regime. Well, we're going to continue with the Israelites' desert wanderings this week, a wandering which, in which their fears get the better of them. And Israel, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are very much in our minds and prayers this week. The outbreak of war has hit our headlines, as well as the missiles, bullets and bombs have hit people and places of that land. It's another war to add to the ones still holding our attention and to eclipse the ones which aren't. Another war that seems so sudden and unexpected, yet it's another war that has come from a pressure cooker of pr provocations waiting to explode for years. This isn't a service that will delve deep into what's going on in Israel, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank at the moment, but links are there to be drawn upon and touched upon in our readings. We'll also make links with the Holy Land with our prayers for today, which have been written by the Archbishop of Jerusalem and others. But we will and we do remember other conflicts and troubles in our world today. They're all represented by what you see beside me. We have the colours of the Ukrainian flag, remembering the war there and elsewhere. Beside it is a bag of hope, the rainbow doves of peace upon it, representing the Holy Spirit that is available to console and comfort everyone in dark times and in good times. On the back, is a quote from Desmond Tutu, which says, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And I hope and pray that you will be able to find that hope for yourself and for others. Next to the bag, we have a stole with a Jerusalem cross embroidered upon it. It was made by refugees in Bethlehem and blessed by the Archbishop of Jerusalem, giving us a tangible and visible link to the Holy Land. Beside that, we have a candle with the light of Christ shining above a holding cross brought from being on the stone on which Jesus' body was laid and anointed before burial. The two remind us that the tree upon which Christ was crucified became the tree of life, that Christ has defeated death and offers access to God to all for eternity. With those symbols, let's spend a moment in silence, reflecting on them and bringing all that we have and been and experienced this week to God before we pray 
and hear passages of scripture for today. servant rule. Your kingdom breaks our tangled webs, where state and religion collude to worship power and trade on fear. Grant us the wit and will to give you what is your own, no more nor less than all the world and time. Through Jesus Christ, whose kingdom comes. The first reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. It's the parable of the wedding banquet, and you'll find it in chapter 22. Again, there's links to the passages and to the prayers in the description with this video. So let's hear the Gospel according to Matthew. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call all who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the street and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And our second reading comes from the book of Exodus. It's from chapter 32, the first 14 verses. When people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on your ears of the, your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it into a mould, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day, and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to rebel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them, 
they have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath will burn hot against them and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord. He said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say that it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster upon your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring upon his people. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Before I bring you the message I've been guided to this week, let's take a moment with these symbols to let those passages sink in, and then I'll pray. God of invitation and guidance, may the words that I speak be the words that you want me to speak, and may the words that are heard be the words that you want to be heard. I ask this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. But in our Gospel passage of the week, Jesus basically said to take God seriously. In the passage we heard from Exodus earlier as well, it would seem that the Israelites didn't do that, or rather that their fears clouded their judgment and led them down a road that almost led to their destruction. Because in their journey, since God's promise of protection and provision to Noah and then Abraham, their provocations and regular misjudgments caused an explosion of divine wrath. In the timeline of the Israelites' exodus, God had only just given them the Ten Commandments, or rules for life. Rules to guide them into enjoying a life of love and respect. Rules asking to be taken seriously. Rules that were not. And fear was one of the reasons why. Earlier in Exodus 20 it says, When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has only come to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. 
Well, Moses disappeared from view to receive the fine print of the rules for life. Laws and ordinances concerning altars, slaves, violence, property, restitution, religion and society, justice, rest and celebration. Moses returned with the news before being brought, called back to the mountain by God for a further 40 days and 40 nights. In that time, he received instructions on how to build a worship in the temple that they would travel with in their desert wanderings. But Moses hadn't come off the mountain when he expected to. The 40 days and 40 nights were up, but still no Moses. In their Exodus wanderings, the Israelites were vulnerable Vulnerable to more than the desert climate or the scarcity of food and drink. Beyond threats to their physical safety and sustenance, they also carried with them the deep trauma from a time of dark oppression. This mindset made them nervous when their leader and their access to God was absent. So when Moses didn't return when expected, it's not natural that panic and fear set in. Moses wasn't just their leader, he was their access to God. With him absent, they were alone in the wilderness with little idea what, about what was supposed to happen next. They wanted, they needed more than the words Moses had previously left with them. They wanted God's active presence with them to protect them and to guide them. So they turned to the second in command. Moses' brother, spokesperson and deputy, they turned to Aaron. Sometimes fear and panic and stress can lead us to say and do things which we wouldn't normally do. It plays with our doubts, questioning what we know to be true, clouding our ability to, to see or to have confidence in the right course of action. We might say, promise or do things that we think people want if it helps us to get through a difficult situation, if it helps us to carry favour with those we want or need to impress. All eyes were upon Aaron, but just as Moses was clouded from view, so was Aaron's judgment. Like a politician trying to tell people what they want to hear without delivering it, Aaron played with the ambiguities of the situation. In his mind, he didn't abandon God or his principles. He created something to represent God and proclaim the festival to the Lord. And the calf? The calf was a bull, and the bull was a common ancient symbol of prowess in battle. Here symbolising God who defeated Pharaoh and brought Israel out of Egypt. The gold reflects the riches to be applied to the temple of God, the temple of God that God had instructed them to build and transport. The eating, drinking and singing were there to celebrate God. It wasn't exactly what God had said to do, but it was well-intentioned. Well, it might have been well-intentioned worship and it would have had a ring of truth to those around him, but Aaron would have known it went beyond being misguided. Instead of alleviating people's fears by doing what God had asked, he fed them, fed into their fears and contravened the very commandments Moses had brought from God before returning to the mountain 40 days and nights ago. Whether Aaron did it to distract people from their perceived peril or not, whether he did it to protect his position or not, he placed them all in peril with a clear sign that they were not taking God's word, will and presence seriously. It was a dangerous degree of disobedience and distrust of the divine, and God got wind of it. Thankfully for Aaron and the Israelites, upon hearing from God what was going on and what God wanted to do about it, 
Moses was able to persuade God to act differently. It's one of the multiple occasions in the Bible where we see that God values and takes on board what we want. Well, as well as showing how fear can divide people and drive people to want actions which ultimately harm them, it also highlights a problem solved by Christ. As I've alluded to, prior to Jesus opening up access to God to everyone through the Holy Spirit that he sent after his ascension into heaven, access to God was by a few select individuals that God spoke through. In our Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, we see that God mostly spoke and was accessed through a few choice individuals. Prophets like Isaiah, judges like Deborah, and of course leaders like Moses. But Jesus warned that it wasn't just God's invitation that should be taken seriously, but the access to God that the invitation grants us all as well. Simply accepting the invitation and turning up is not good enough. History and stories in which the unfaithful Israel is condemned should not be an encouragement to feel smug or superior because of the work done by Christ. Rather, it's an encouragement for each one of us to absorb the gravity and gift of God's invitation, presence and grace and to treat it seriously and with reverence. Whether intended or not, Aaron fed the Israelites fears and took them to the brink. Whether intended or not, some in positions of power and influence in our current time have fed into people's fears in recent years and taken them and others to the brink and beyond, not least in Israel, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, the very lands where Jesus modelled peace. In our moments of fear, whether for ourselves or for others, we need more than ever to take seriously what God has offered and made available to us all. Love instead of hate, wisdom instead of ignorance, peace instead of war. I'm going to end with a prayer from Hassan Naum, the Archbishop of Jerusalem and the Middle East offered to us and to God this week. Let's pray. O God of all justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of pain, the trauma of violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land. Be with those who need, who need you in these days of suffering. We pray for people of all faiths, Jews, Muslims, Christians, and for people of the land. And while we pray to you, O Lord, for an end to violence and the establishment of peace, we also call for you to bring justice and equity to the people. Guide us into your kingdom, where all the people are treated with dignity and honour as your children, for to all of us you are our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Archbishop Hassan's prayer was sent out in a newsletter from St George's College in Jerusalem, a place where I found that stole. There's a link to it in the description that comes from this video and I commend it to you. In the newsletter, Richard Sewell, the Dean of the College, included a comment on the current situation, again, that I commend to you. He included some further prayers, which we're going to use now for our concluding time of prayer. There'll be moments of silence in between each one. Use those, please, for your reflection and your responses to God.
God of peace. We pray for the peoples of Palestine and Israel in these perilous and dangerous times. We also pray for those subject to war and persecution elsewhere in the world, in the places we remember like Ukraine, Syria and Yemen, and in the places which we do not, but which you do. We pray for all who are fearful for the safety of their loved ones and themselves. We pray for that the assurance of unfailing love, even in the midst of danger, settles upon them. Shelter them from despair and protect them from harm. For all who are wounded, we pray they find healing. For all who have died, we pray they find rest. For all who grieve, we pray that they find comfort. For leaders on all sides, we pray for a renewed will to lay down arms, for the strength to put the grievances and wrongs suffered by their people to rest, and for the conviction to embrace a path of reconciliation and peace that preserves the rights and dignity for all of your children. God of mercy, help us to remember that there is no border that can separate us from your great love and protection, no stone that can sound the well of your deep, deep mercy. God of justice, we pray with hopeful hearts that your beloved children of the Holy Land will be spared the future of sustained violence and unrest and the reconciliation, recognition of the humanity of all people will prevail. In a moment of silence and peace, let us each offer up our own prayer for those and that which is on our heart and in our thoughts today. Let us join together in this time of prayer with this prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. To the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A link to those prayers, to 
Archbishop Hassan's prayers and to Richard Sewell's letter is in the description accompanying this video. I hope they help inform your own prayers for the week ahead. Well, our time together has come to an end. Before I say goodbye, I'd love to offer you a blessing. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may lead you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer and Comforter, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Whatever your week ahead looks like before, during and afterwards, I hope and pray that you will find things to make you smile within it. Take care of yourself and others. Goodbye.